Our first order of business is the uh, Facilities Master Planning Community Forum. I'm going to turn the floor over to Dr. Wellman, but first I need to read the open forum announcement. Note that the board has allotted time later in the agenda for those who desire to make comments to the board. Persons who wish to participate in this portion of the meeting, the open forum on the agenda, shall sign up on the list provided at the back of the room and indicate the topic, topic about which they wish to speak. No presentation shall exceed three minutes. Delegations of more than five persons should appoint one person to present their views before the board and should not exceed five minutes. And with that, I will turn the floor over to Dr. Wellman. Thank you, Mr. Hargett. Thank you all um, in the audience and in our community for being here this evening. We are getting to the last phase of a very long, tedious, uh, hard-working process of, of developing a 10-year facilities master plan. <coughs> and so as after four symposium in the springtime, our master planning uh, consultants from the Cunningham Group and Fields and Company uh, located here in Austin have brought back uh, to our master plan task force ideas based on their uh, based on our work in the springtime and we worked on those again yesterday and most of the day today and so we feel really good about the scenarios that we're presenting tonight but obviously another opportunity to engage in the process another opportunity especially for our board members to uh, provide feedback, feedback, direction, um, and help us as we're getting to the final recommendations of this process. Um, I'm very proud of our task force. I'm very proud of our community. The engagement has been tremendous, and the input has been very, very useful. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Judy Hoskins, uh, Cunningham Group. Is presented to you before, and we'll quickly go through the first sessions and get to the meat. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us this evening to share in the recommendations that everyone here at EANS ISD has been working so hard on over the last nine, ten months. Time goes fast. Uh, so we're really thrilled to be able to share the latest evolution of those plans with you this evening. Just to tell you a little bit about what we're going to do this evening, uh, we're going to briefly just review where we've come and how we got to where we are to this point. We're going to talk about and review the master planning parameters, the process, the think outside the blocks. Many of you were involved in that exercise. Uh, we're going to share the recommendations with you. We're going to give some time for the board to reflect upon what they've seen. We're going to go through some initial costs and phasing, and then we're going to talk about the next steps because we're going to come back one more time in October. Next. So, as you can see from this timeline, and I'm going to point to it, we are at this point right here. We're going to come back one more time in October. So we're not done. So this is just to share with you the recommendations that have been developed to this point. Next. This is kind of a synopsis of all of the different symposiums that we've held here within the community. The culmination of the very first symposium resulted in a shared vision statement. Many of you have participated in this process. Second symposium, we worked on facilities, principles, and standards. The principles were those things that we are going to commit to. What are our beliefs? that support the vision that you co-created together. The standards were the physical implications. If these are the types of learning activities that we want to support, what implications does that have upon our facility? 
We did a gap analysis. Using that lens, we looked at each school, each site, and went, okay, where are the gaps? If this is what we're trying to teach, if this is the kind of learning that we want to have happen at each site, then what are the gaps? What's preventing us from doing that? We developed some district-wide scenarios. Okay, this is our kit of parts. These are the kinds of improvements we want to have happen at each site across the district overall. Then we went into the specific sites and we really dropped down in altitude a little bit more and said, okay, what does this mean now at each site? What might that look like? This evening, we're gonna share the synthesis of all of the conversations of all of the work that you've laid to date. And then finally, we'll come back one more time and we'll talk about the cost estimates and phasing recommendations. We will go through those preliminarily this evening to get you started to help with that thought process between now and that time we come back next. This slide we included because these are all of the folks that were involved in this process. It's very, very important that a master plan reflect the community that it serves. It is a living, breathing document, not one that's supposed to stay on the shelf, but one that you refer to often and regularly to make sure that it is supporting your vision and objectives within the district. Again, Everything you see this evening really has come out of your conversations. It is your master plan. It's a, it's a design with and not for approach. Next. Just to summarize, everything we do needs to support the mission and vision of Ian's ISD. It starts with the learners and your goals and objectives for the kind of attributes that you want to be able to instill in them in order for them to succeed in a global knowledge economy. It's supported by best practices. It's built on common ground. Together, we identified what those common ground elements are. Next. Again, just to reinforce, all of this information formed the foundation for our work together. Next. Many of you participated in this process. This was the culmination of the very first symposium. This was the shared vision statement that you all crafted for the facilities master plan. I'm gonna read it aloud because I think it's that important to remind ourselves of what we promised. EANS ISD will provide for its community of learners facilities and environments that foster collaboration and enhance engagement, exploration, and purposeful application for deep, lifelong learning. <coughs> EANS ISD will have technology rich, energy efficient, fiscally responsible, and financially sustainable facilities that provide opportunities for student choice in creative and enriching activities and promote the involvement of the greater EANS community. The facilities will provide furniture, tools, and workspaces that are forward-thinking, flexible, and adaptable for relevant, meaningful, and personalized learning. Facilities and environments will allow the intentional design of experiences and life skills necessary for each student's future in a global community. Pretty powerful words. Those words guided this process. Next. Last time we were here, we came to consensus around a group of parameters. I'm just going to review those with you. The very first one you talked about is providing for 21st century learning. And if you were part of the very first community forum, there was a lot of feedback around the importance of not just looking at the learning that happens within the physical parameters of the structure of the building, but how do we leverage the fact that we are in Austin, Texas, and we can learn outdoors as well. 
So we're just gonna share a couple of images to help you imagine the kinds of learning that could also happen outdoors. This is Sidwell Middle School in Washington, D.C. And this is a, a, a wonderful garden where the children grow their own food, they harvest their own crops, uh, really helps connect them to their environment. It's all about health and wellness. It is part of the curriculum, yes. If anybody uh, is familiar with the school, this is where President Obama's uh, children go. It really is a, a wonderful facility in terms of its um, ability to have the architecture reinforce the learning that's happening within that school. Just some other um, images to help you imagine the possibilities for learning outside and how do you leverage the, the landscape that you have here within Eads ISD. Next. You have some wonderful rolling terrain. How might we leverage that and utilize that to create spaces for gathering, for collaboration, for presentation? Structured shelter. It does get very hot here. Um, and so what are some of the creative ways to help create comfortable places for learners to gather. Next. So some more of the parameters that we all came to consensus around. Design schools to provide a safe, secure, and accessible environment. We know the importance of safety and security in effective learning experiences. Provide for the range of student-driven program opportunities within enriching activities. Let's provide the full range of experiences here within Ian's ISD. Make sure that we tap into the energy and joy of learning for each child. Plan for equity among schools at the same level, including travel time for students, program offerings, and enrichment opportunities. How do we de decrease the distances that some learners have to travel to get to their schools right now? Next. Maintain the same grade level organization, K5, 6, 8, 9, 12. That stays the same. And finally, plan for moderate enrollment growth. Uh, we've identified the 2022 moderate K-12 projections without out-of-district transfers as a target for the 10-year planning horizon. That came out of the demographic study. And this is what we came to consensus around. Next. Okay, so in summary, how many students should we plan for? When we're looking at the elementary grades, K to five, um, the current capacity of your schools, this is not the enrollment, this is capacity, stands at 3413. The moderate 2022 projection without transfers is 3549. That's what we're planning for. Middle level grades, we're planning for 1957. High school grades, 2715 for a total of 8,221. Next. We talked about uh, within one of the parameters, uh, making sure that the elementaries are more closely aligned in their size. And so we said we would aim for schools that range between four sections minimally and six sections maximum. Next. Actually, go back a second, because I do want to emphasize. You're, you're, you see that middle column there, capacity at 92% full? That's because in an ideal world, we would be functioning at 100% capacity, but it's not an ideal world. And so, uh, on average, elementary schools function at about 92% effectiveness. And so that's where those numbers come from. And so that's where you see the 3,541 aligning with the 3,549 goal. Okay, next. All right, and similarly for the middle schools, uh, 980 just split between the two schools just for the sake of conversation with Westlake High School at 2,715 for the moderate 2022 projection without transfers. All right, 
Next. Okay, the final parameters, how students, children, and staff in permanent quality construction. No portables. Remember that conversation? School size, elementary schools, and here's what I was just mentioning, that the schools should trend toward five or six round size with four section minimum to narrow the size range from what currently exists. Reduce the unrelated district functions located on the West Lake High School property to regain land for high school functions. And you'll see that tonight in the plans. Next. Provide early childhood learning facilities to support early learners, residents, and staff. It's a key activity we need to support. K, as resources that engage the entire community, develop facilities that support learners of all ages. That speaks to the fact that our schools truly do need to serve as resources for the entire community. L, consider expansion of public-public and public-private partnerships. How do we leverage that? How do we take advantage of this community and your businesses and leverage those partnerships and integrate them into the learning experiences? Okay, then we did district-wide scenario planning. Can I see a show of hands of how many of you participated in some of the charrette workshops that we held? Okay. <coughs> many of you did. Okay, so you, you'll remember this. Okay, the common ground recommendations included upgrading learning spaces throughout the district to support 21st century learning and we had many conversations around what that means and what that entails. Secondly, create a new elementary school on the River Hills site serving the west side of the district. Thirdly, another common element across all those schemes was to create a community center on or near the high school site. Relocate the transportation and maintenance building off the high school site. Repurpose either Valley View Elementary or Forest Trail Elementary for a variety of district functions. And finally, create regional CDC centers serving the east and west sides. Again, hopefully you will see all these things manifested in the plans that you're going to uh, see this evening. Next. We did that Think Outside the Blocks design exercise. And I just want to emphasize again that this whole process has been a design with process and not a design for. These plans are a direct evolution from all of our work together up to this point. Just some images of, of the great energy and creativity that was put forth. Um, we did some brainstorming around what exactly might go into an ideal neighborhood that supports 21st century learning? And also, what would an ideal elementary school look like? What are the components that would go into it? Next. And then these were some of the individual um, model plans that each school generated. So we have Barton Creek, Forest Trail, and we're just gonna, this is just for reference purposes, just to kind of jog all of our memory in terms of all of the work that went into generating these plans that you're going to see this evening. Let's just flip through these, John. All right, that brings us to this evening. This evening is therefore a synthesis of all of this work, and you have all done a tremendous amount of work that has led to this point. Okay. I won't read through it all, but you can you can see it. It's been it's been a joy and a privilege for us to work with all of you to get to this point. Next. Integrated and ongoing community feedback. That's why we're here this evening. It's important. Again, a master plan serves your community. Your schools really are a key to any successful community. You have a high level of quality here at Eanes ISD. Do you remember our conversation that if you're coasting, you're going downhill? So how do we continue 
to keep that standard high here, to continue to innovate, to best prepare your learners for success in a global knowledge economy because that's what they're entering. They're not just competing with kids from around Texas, from around the United States, but they truly are competing with those from around the world. So now we're going to go into the sharing of the recommendations. Do we have one more image? Yes, okay. Here's kind of the common the common ground that came out of these recommendations. These I will go through because I think it's that important uh, before we go into the next um, event where you're going to actually see the plans at each site. So first bullet, upgrade learning spaces at every school throughout the district for 21st century learning. Second, create a new elementary school and CDC on the west side, serving the west side of the district potentially the River Hill site. Accommodate the need for a multi-purpose facility on the Shriner site adjacent to the high school site. A significant addition at Westlake High School to unify the campus and accommodate a variety of unmet academic and activities needs. Currently, your students are going to multiple places to have those needs met. How do we bring that back to the high school site? Consolidate multiple district operational departments in a new facility on the Shriner site. Again, how do we maximize um, our efficiency? How do we demonstrate best fiscal responsibility that you outlined in the vision statement? Finally, repurpose the existing Forest Trail Elementary as a community learning center to consolidate an east side CDC, a professional development center, and a variety of additional district programs. This is a summary of those things that you're going to see this evening. Now, for those of you that were here the very first time, you remember our speed sharing event where you walked around and we, uh, we gave you seven minutes at each site and then we had you shift to the next site so that you could make it all around the district, figuratively speaking within a very short amount of time. Now, this evening, we have the privilege of having um, our principals um, be the ones presenting these schemes with you this evening. Again, this has been a design with process and not a design for. everybody could we please give our principals a round of applause for the great job that they just did I think that this is just a testament to the fact that again these plans sprung from all of your participation and they really are unique to Ian's ISD. What we'd like to do now is I'm going to introduce Kathy Wallace, and she's just kind of quickly going to take you through uh, the Community Learning Center, and then we will open it up to feedback and questions from the board. Thanks, Judy. Um, as you probably noticed, the Forest Trail community would be is proposed to be or recommended to be located at this building in the future and what that means is that there's an opportunity to provide a district um, community learning center that brings together a number of different functions and this relates to that parameter of providing for learners of all ages. It would be located at the existing forest trails we can which is well suited for this type of use because there are multiple wings at different levels, which allows it to become a number of separate uses. What this plan shows is, um, let's see, best way to start is to say that there's a mixture of uses, including a child development center, and those are the pale blue uses in the back wing, and that, that wing can be secured so it would be possible to enter off the drop-off loop, it's number five in the upper left-hand corner, 
come into the building and then drop children off in that wing. We'd also have secure play in the courtyard, as well as out back. A portion of the administration related to curriculum instruction would locate in this building because of a link to professional development. So the curriculum folks um, and the, the purple spaces are something that we're calling a professional development center, a number of um, adult learning spaces. Now they can be used for community education courses, for um, teacher education classes, and so on. The gym and dining area would remain community use spaces. Um, the dining area would be improved so that it could be used as the board, board room space um, for those nights when it's not possible to get a cafeteria in another building. And then there's a couple spaces uh, for community ed functions such as community art spaces. And the community ed offices uh, and the foundation offices would be here, which frees up a, a building that Bob has said, Bob Servi, uh, charge of facilities has said, if we could just get that building off our list of to-dos, it would save me so much. So this makes that possible. Questions? The purple area at the top, is that, that's not the current portable? That's actually the lower level. So that's below the area in blue and it circulates, or there's a stair to it. It's where the library is. Okay. It's the library. Okay. It's where the library is now. Right. The, portable the portables are gone and the space where the portables are, you know, if, if that lower level is a, a if that is instructional space, that is actually the possibility for a learning patio where the portables are now. And does this take all of the administrative functions out of the admin building? No, not at all. Regular, uh, it takes the curriculum and instruction function out of the ad building and business HR and So it puts a board room in this building? The scope uh, of construction is mostly kind of medium level remodeling to make spaces age appropriate for the CDC or for adult learners um, and some refurbishing. No new construction. So Judy. I think now we'll open it up to questions, comments from the board and we will those for you. You don't want to go in order, Cal, you want to? One of the, one of the things, some, hello, testing one too. One of the things that um, particularly impressed me about my little tour was that despite the different structures and different challenges that each particular campus had in terms of its impervious cover or, incur, or in terms of its current structure and where they could build and where they couldn't build. Somehow, as I went from station to station, I noticed that in different ways, but always a component, there were, there were the parameters that you mentioned at the very beginning. So everybody talked about um, outside outside learning, right. uh, you know where that was obviously was different depending on the the dynamics of the uh, the uh, the campus layout. Uh, there were group learning opportunities and structures, and so while obviously each building had its own unique characteristics and. Um, each principal, I'm sure, had their, their hand in seeing some of the things that they wanted to have happen. I still saw all these components, though manifested differently, they were all in, the, in each campus site, which was something that I was really impressed by and very pleased to see, so that we have some uh, autonomy, campus to campus autonomy, 
yet with some very common, important principles. So that was the thing that I was really encouraged and pleased to see. Thank you very much. Great job, Facilities Task Force. <laughs> Um, I too, I thought um, they were all unique, which was nice to see and thoughtfully done. Um, especially liked the use of outdoor spaces, either utilizing or reutilizing or creating new ones. Um, also flexible spaces. I think flexible spaces for, for both the teachers and the learners are equally as important and um, it's something that we lack. Um, and even looking at travel patterns of how parents can access the buildings um, was looked at. Um, a little bit concerned about some use of open classroom spaces because I um, was privy to part of that era at the end and where I saw those classroom spaces redone to not be open anymore. So um, I hate to go back to that phase of education again. Um, my overall thought was how different is this from a bond that failed, um, was it down five years ago or four years ago? And because a lot of this from the, although it never got into the deep level detail that we have tonight, um, the overall concept's very similar. And so what are things that, you know, the uh, public will, um, support and what will they not support and how will this be phased in and um, how can we um, make sure that we're really getting a representative of um, the community. When I look out in the crowd and I've looked at all these different forums and see very few 65 plus taxpayers represented in the crowd and um, they can kill whatever we dream. Um, I'm also concerned about what you have up here. I'm concerned for a few reasons because I don't think the forest trail community is necessarily wants to give up their building. Um, I'm concerned because CDC is not a requirement for our school district to have. Um, so we're asking taxpayers to pay money for something that is not a mandatory function. Um, and professional development, how is that gonna change with the digital age and um, use of iPads and laptops and um, a lot of professional development can be done in um, very flexible spaces in different locations and not necessarily in a centralized location. So those are just thoughts that ran through my head as I looked at the nine different campuses and the um, community learning center. I, uh, one of the things I think it's important to keep in mind is we're talking about a phased approach. We're not talking about going to the voters and asking for everything at once and so we're probably looking at i'm, I'm guessing what are we looking at a 10-year time Correct. frame so, yep. so we're not looking at going for everything at once um, i was struck by number one the practicality of what the groups designed uh, i thought that they worked well with their existing structure i didn't get the sense uh, i've yet to see the cost estimate but i didn't get the sense that there was a lot of champagne Right. taste being, being uh, flavor being added to the existing structure and I, and I hope that when we see the cost estimates ultimately that that, I'm, I'm, that still bears out to be true. I was excited to see the um, the end of portables. Uh, my kids have not been in schools that have those but when I've made visits to campuses I, I, they struck me. I, I still think our kids are getting a great education but I think it's important that we get rid of those. And I like the idea, too, of space that is flexible in terms of being more expansive for greater learning, but that you can also compartmentalize as necessary. I think uh, I, too, am a product of open schools to some extent later in my education experience. And um, when I see the ability to compartmentalize an open area, I think that makes a difference. And so those are the things that struck me. Um, I'm impressed with the hard work that the steering committee, the, <coughs> the parents, the teachers, the principals, the administration put into the plan, and uh, I, I think it's going to be important that we approach it in a very common sense way when it comes time to, to look at a bond. Excellent. Thank you. What 
a wonderful outcome for a long collaborative community-based process with a lot of different points of view and a lot of feedback. So congratulations to you. Uh, to you leaders on that and congratulations to everybody who participated in the process that throughout all of the campuses it was so fun to see the collaborative, secure, accessible, flexible space coming through largely in the same footprints. I mean with um, impervious cover concerns, with cost concerns, um, those sorts of things mean we can't go for the Cadillac models but it does mean that we can use what we have very creatively and um, uh, we, we got teased with some creativity the last time around but this takes it to uh, some, some points of definition and some real exciting places. Um, even though we didn't see a board on it, I am so thrilled that we are remaining committed to a West Side Elementary School, an additional West Side Elementary School. Uh, I think that's integral to this plan even though it was not one of the boards. Um, um, so to me that is that is kind of a linchpin of what this feedback and this master plan in terms of where we should be looking at all students and, um, and all concerns. Um, I, I, I thought tonight I was going to be disappointed if I didn't see that third middle school, but then seeing the, um, the numbers and the capacities, I, was, I understood why. And then when I saw the presentations and saw the richness of the elective experience that is coming through in the existing middle schools, I felt like that created that magic in the middle and that individualized opportunity for our middle school students. So I, I feel like the two schools we have can do a fabulous job and um, understand why we're not going forward for that third one. I was very thrilled to see the outdoor learning um, spaces identified. I, I do want to articulate that in my mind, outdoor learning is, is not just having classes go outside. It is about environmental science. And that's what I think our unique um, position in Central Texas with the environmental concerns of this community and this region, I think that's where we could really expand our programming efforts yes. for environmental yeah. science education in in the outdoor setting. You have such a wonderful opportunity to do that. Um, I was thrilled with the redeployment redeployment plan for Forest Trail. Um, Forest Trail's been a building that has kind of been a, a bugaboo forever because of the, the levels and, um, and that sort of thing. And it lends itself really well to provide space for these activities, which even though we will become more technology rich, the human interaction and the spaces for professional collaboration face-to-face -face exist. Um, centralizing the child development centers, and I do think the child development centers are a very great asset to us as employers of a large, largely female staff. I think having child development centers is, is very, very critical, and many of the children in CDC are staff children. So I, I feel like it is something that we need to do. Having it centralized, uh, the, the huge benefit of that is it frees up classroom space in some of our lower enrollment elementary schools, which really does help with that um, equalization across elementary schools. So I, I, I didn't think I was gonna like that because I'm all about having babies close by, but I, I, I see that it works. I think the staff feels that it works and it really makes a difference in some of those schools. That's why you sit by Bo and Mike. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we collaborate well on this end. We have a flexible space here. Um, so anyway, I think there is just, there's a wealth of really exciting, common sense, common ground solutions that were presented tonight. Um, thank you for letting me say these are my favorite. I, I do have one concern about the two um, parking areas at Eanes Elementary. I mean, we spent so much time thinking about security on that campus. I'm, I'm still working on that okay. in terms of having a such a big parking area in the lower area, but the, the secure entrance in the front. So okay. thank you. Um, that's one thing I'll need to chew on a little bit. You know, and that's one thing that um, if we could take just a minute to emphasize is that the plans that you saw tonight are one way of accomplishing 
your vision. It's not necessarily the way, but it's to help you imagine what's possible at each site. When we get into the more traditional phases of architecture, schematic design, design development, and so forth, that's when you really will go back and design specifically at each site so that there will be plenty of opportunity to still have those conversations and work out those details. Okay, last but not least, first off, I'd like to really acknowledge all the district employees. Last time I saw Dr. Carter yesterday, I think it was about 9 o'clock last night, and uh, you know, here we are going at it again. And, and I don't think people appreciate the long hours that all of you put in, and I just want to take a minute. I know this is extracurricular activity, and, and everybody really appreciates it. Thank, thank you so much for all the things that you do. One of the things that Dr. Carter said when he was uh, showing the Westlake upgrades that kind of stuck with me, when I, when I asked about the robotics area, he said, yeah, this, and he explained the area up there, and he said it's designed after something I saw a while back that we, that we, you know, in, in Palo Alto. And as I think about it, you know, I mean, comparing our kids, our kids, I mean, that's our competition. And looking at what's going on in Palo Alto, I mean, I, I just, that really resonated with me. And I think that we should we should be open as a community to larger possibilities and what can we really achieve when we think big. And I think that's what this is all about. I, I also really liked the Eanes Elementary design. I thought it was very innovative and very cool. Um, I really liked the fine arts focus in the middle schools. I, I think that's a big deal in our community and, and uh, they are really stretched to capacity uh, in my experience. And I also am very much behind um, you know, an, an elementary school on the west side, and I think we have some challenges there. But again, I, I hope I hope that we will we will be open to larger possibilities and see what we can do to make some big things happen over the next couple of years. Thank you. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I've been uh, a long time advocate of a new elementary school on, on the west side, and. The fact that we have two elementary schools side by side was an experiment several years ago that failed miserably and now we end up with a mistake. It's just simply a mistake to have two elementary schools side by side. The, the model that we tried didn't work. <clears throat> so do we have to live with it? And hopefully we don't. And the, it was encouraging to me to see that there was so much consensus about having a new elementary school on the west side. I do have and share one concern with Colleen. I don't know if you said this exactly, but I know it was implied in your statement, is that a uh, new school on the west side in uh, a building now uh, still utilizing quite a bit of electricity, resources, and things like that. So we know where we're vulnerable, and that is with m and So I have a question maybe for Dr. Wellman or maybe some of the um, engineers in the room. Are there, are there ways in which this extra square footage can be Build such as the MO issue can be minimized. That is, we're saving a little bit of, we're, we're consolidating CDC, so maybe we gain a little efficiency there. Uh, of course, the new school at River Hills will be probably state of the art in terms of energy efficiency, yet it's the MO that we struggle with year by year, and I'm, I'm hoping that that people have some strategies for addressing the potential m and increase with this new school at the River Hill site or wherever it's going to be, and then in addition to the continuing use of the two elementary schools. Well, I'll ask Bob Servi to, to stand up and speak as well, Dr. Kelson, but you're exactly right. Our facility assessment <coughs> Is, you know, needs assessment that we went through was to help us look at our long-term replacement of equipment that will, and roofing and 
uh, our current envelope of buildings so that they could be more energy efficient. And in fact, we've reduced our energy significantly. I don't have the 16 percent. 16 percent in the last two years. Just this past year. In the last. 24 percent in the past. 22 percent in the last. replacing equipment that was old and antiquated. Of course, the new one would be every time we remodel and redo buildings, we're going to bring in equipment that's more energy efficient than before. So just because we increase square footage does not mean, in fact, should mean that we have more energy efficiency as we remodel each of our buildings. It's a, it's a benefit for us to do that. you have things to add? To answer some of your uh, questions, concerns, uh, in looking at Forest Trail, we've already met with engineers and they've started yesterday walking the campuses to give us an idea of what we can do different moving forward to be more energy efficient. Uh, one of the things that they are looking at with the Forest Trail, because we gave them some ideas of what we may be going toward, is looking at instead of you doing a chiller type plant, is do it in such a way to where we can shut down those wings that aren't being utilized so we don't have the full chillers up and running for three classrooms to where we can compartmentalize each portion of that building for the different the different programs that are going on and therefore cutting down on the amount of energy being used both through lighting, heating, cooling, uh, and ventilation. Uh, same type thing with this type of building. They have where we may go with this building so they can look at it both different directions and the best way to um, put a new mechanical system into this facility to where it would be brand new and we can do the same type thing where the gymnasium standalone so only it has to be running when there's an event or during the summers the uh, administration area has its own separate system to where they can come in and work and it's climatized there and the rest of the building that is unoccupied can be shut down those are some of the things we've already started looking at and moving forward with the different sites thank you very much I appreciate it appreciate you addressing that Cal, great question, a great, great point. Um, in looking at the forest trail redeployment, it looks like about half of it could be consumed by CDC and um, community education, and aren't both of those enterprise front funds that would pay for themselves? In other words, the 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 M and O expended wouldn't come out of the M and O budget; it would come out of the funds generated, the revenue generated from those um, programs themselves. So something to keep in mind that, um, that if we think about everything that we do that's an enterprise fund that could pay its own way from an MO standpoint, that might be um, something to consider. What, what about our child nutrition does as well? Our child nutrition pays us energy. And so would their offices be in here? So that would be another example of where that enterprise fund could um, cover those costs. Does the enterprise fund um, cover the cost of like maintenance? security they they reimburse the general fund for their expenses their percentage of expenses anyone else I want to add one more thing I, I think that I wouldn't say they're, they're necessarily our two most pressing needs but I think two pressing needs are an elementary on the west side of the district and getting needs elementary in the kind of shape it needs to be in so that it can be a a viable facility going forward and so I like I like what I've seen on both of those fronts as well sort of to echo some of the comments Mike made and that other people made about the other the, the, the elementary in the western side so I, I like those aspects of the, of the of the plan thank you so much for the feedback Might be a good time to go into the phasing you bet so it's a perfect segue we're going to share some preliminary costs and phasing and i'm going to ask kathy to come back up and she's going to walk you through that thank you and i think this is um i'll do some reading because i can tell the, the print is pretty small here we have um there's going to be two slides. The first slide shows phasing for the first kind of the the three and six year horizons. We have lumped them together because we think there's some flexibility about flexibility about what divides those two. And then there's an additional one for um, for ten years. 
And what we've done, this is a preliminary indication of kind of a sequence of activities um, without, a com without a deep amount of study. And then on the right-hand side, we're showing a general order of magnitude cost range for the um, grouped projects. So broadly, the first project, the first phase, would be to build that new elementary on the west side. And that's about a 30, 33 to $37 um, million dollar project. I should explain that these costs do include project costs, so it's not just construction costs, it also includes just all of the additional pieces that go into putting together a project. The next phase would be, and um, the chair, the board chair has highlighted the two kind of key projects, would be to do remodeling at Eanes Elementary. And the new elementary school on the west side would allow this building to be vacated, at which point it would be available as staging for a year while um, Eanes Elementary was built. And then the, what would follow would be uh, the remainder of the elementary school improvements at the other buildings. They're currently listed in alphabetical order. So Barton, Bridge Point, Cedar Creek, and the, the final one, if you're allowing this building to be used as swing space, would be to construct the addition here and uh, remodel this building. And the rough range for doing the remodeling and addition work, as well as facility uh, condition improvements that were indicated as being high or medium priorities at each of the elementary schools is um, about 38 to $42 million. Next element would be to construct that consolidated central services building that includes the maintenance and operations piece uh, and the grounds and another a number of people who have been scattered and haven't been able to work efficiently together on the Shriner site. Then what would follow would be the remodeling and additions at the middle schools. And those, again, those might be done in parallel with the elementary work. There's no reason, those are not dependent. And then finally, um, at the high school, the first phase that might be built would be, well, that would need to happen would be the activities addition that provides the replacement gym and activity space for so that the uh, existing, the oldest piece on the high school campus could be demolished to make room for the, the linking addition. So in terms of general costs, the central, the district-wide facilities, about six million. <coughs> And the second secondary school work on the order of thirty million for that for this phase. If you include escalation, there's a total that gets to about one hundred twenty million for that first first phase. The ten year group of projects and phasing uh, are listed with the high school kind of the remaining high school work, so the two story building. Um, and additional remodeling within that building. That's on the order of 33, 36 million dollars. Then the district facility, district-wide facilities work, moving those, moving the buses from the high school site, which is one of the parameters of getting those functions off of the high school campus. Uh, developing rede the redeployment of Forest Trail as a community learning center, and then the next priority items from the district facility assessment, and that's about a $27 million um, element. And, and I should say that those pieces, Bob talked about uh, some of the efforts underway to make the facilities more energy efficient. This, these phases, both the first, uh, first six years and these 10 years, include about 50 million in, that's in construction cost. So, by the time you get to project costs, it's even larger, so probably 60, 75 million, to make those sorts of improvements that will reduce maintenance and energy expenditures. And then finally, the last two here 
um, are the outdoor pool and the multi-purpose facility. Now we recognize that those may happen through a different mechanism, possibly a public-private partnership, and they may not happen in the last 10 years, but um, that's where they're located in terms of this master plan. Any questions? Uh, we had talked, board members, about that first phasing and, and lumping three and six years together. After the, the feedback from this week and your feedback, which we will ongoing, we'll put this draft on the website, we'll continue to receive feedback from Claudia videotaped each of the presentations tonight. We'll also put those on the website and ask for feedback. We'll continue to receive feedback, but we're honing in down to the final recommendations for this so that our master planners can more fully develop this cost, these cost estimates. Um, we're going to kind of give you a general sense of that, but we, we have a lot more detail behind all of these numbers. That those numbers will come back to you the first, the, probably the first study session in October, October the eighth, and then after that, I really do think that rather than our facility um, master planners, planners telling us um, a, a bond program, that's really a board's job to make those decisions about that cut point. We wanted from them of what makes sense in what order, and then you can decide this this is where we'll stop, this is where we'll stop. Um, that to me is a board a board role. So uh, I asked them just to, to put those all together in a, in a lump, and then we'll look at the second part at 10 years. What can we do later? That would be 10 years. So, um, that's how these ended up together. Colleen, did you ask? Yes, um, these rough costs are towards the master plan, but they don't include um, the technology that we're gonna need over that 10 year period. The technology is actually in each of the buildings in terms of it. So it's all inclusive of like any roofing, um, HVAC, all that kind of stuff. And when we, you know, on October the 8th, they've already started this work. But we wanted to make sure all of the input had been thought through um, before those numbers are finalized. We'll come back with a lot <coughs> more detail, but it's in there. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? That's, that's where we are. Well, thank I think, you so much. Um, we're ready. One, One more thing we'd like to share, and I'm going to put Mr. Wirt on the spot. Oh, yeah. Brad, could you please come join me? Oh, of course. I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been awkward. We would like to share um, a video that uh, was put together for the fine work that Bridgepoint is doing subject of school this morning, we wanted to show you what the classroom of the future is going to look like. This year, Eanes ISD is looking into a brand new classroom as they get set to roll out iPads for every single student on the first day of class. Kate Whitehall's live at Bridgepoint Elementary School in West Austin with the details. This is just another way to get the kids excited. It really is, and they call it fun, which is so nice to hear. And you know, Sally, last year they rolled out iPads for the elementary school students throughout the year, but this year will be the first time ever that on the first day of class every single student will be working with an iPad. So with new technology comes a new way of thinking and that's why right here at Bridgepoint Elementary School they are testing out a brand new classroom and when you see it you may be asking is this really an elementary school classroom? So he's probably stuck on a question. When you walk into Julie Semino's third grade classroom, the first thing you'll notice, it doesn't look anything like a third grade classroom. And we're testing out different areas of learning for the children, which include these no chairs on casters and these hockey stools, which allow a lot of movement throughout the room and soft seating options. So the kids really ultimately are gonna be able to choose their best learning environment. All of the goodies you would have stuffed inside your desk are now placed in orange bins on a shelf. The idea? 
for kids to get out of their seats if they need something. The movement will help reset their brains. Bulletin boards have been replaced with glass panels. So the kids will be able to gather around these glass boards and just write their ideas on glass rather than chalk. And forget the stark white walls. A cool green makes for a more calming learning environment. And you can have a choice of either watching this board or you can actually watch the lesson on the iPad. And speaking of learning, it's now mainly digital with the help of the iPad and then Apple TV projecting their thoughts and projects onto the board. I use it as kind of the culmination of a lesson and then they're able to create an end product showing me what they've learned. So it looks like maybe a natural disaster happened. The concept is to give the students the ability to construct their own knowledge with the guidance of the teacher. And when you ask the kids about it, Fun is the word they use most to describe school. I like to use the math games. I like to use apps that make writing more fun. It makes me pay attention more like to what the lesson is. And books are not gone completely. <laughs> Reading books for fun are still out on the shelves, but the textbooks are kept in the cabinets. But I always give them an option. If they prefer to have paper, they can use the traditional textbook or they have a scanned in version that they can open into a program. And the school does have in place some safeguards to make sure the kiddos do not download material that is inappropriate. But when it has happened, they use that as a lesson into what is appropriate and what is not. But guys, you know, I have a three-year-old. I sometimes think he can operate the iPad a little bit better than I can. <laughs> and so for folks like me, uh, they do have an entire class just for parents to kind of get us up to speed ah. on exactly what the kids are doing just in case, you know, they come home and you're like... How are you doing this? Yeah. They'll teach you exactly what they're doing. Hey, along those lines, maybe when your student comes home and they've been on the iPad all day at school, I I'm wondering if they're going to want to be at home on the iPad all day too. Well, you know, your child probably will want to be on the iPad all day, but the whole thing with dealing with screen time, a lot of parents like to limit how much screen time their kiddos get. I asked the teachers about that, and they said because this is such a purposeful use of the iPad, they're not playing video games yeah. on it, uh, parents are more on board with it and maybe not limiting their screen time as much as a result. Okay, thank you so much for that, Kate. We've all been inspired by the videos that we were exposed to, probably at the early the movie night symposium. We looked at a lot of things and thought, well, why not? Uh, could could try that. You've seen the the YouTube of the corning, uh, a day made of glass type of thing that is automatically inspiring as well. Uh, then we started looking at some things and think, well, this is doable, this is doable. I have some teachers and it's all driven by quality people. It always will be as we innovate into the next step who could take an idea and transform it into some function that makes sense for learning. And Julie Semino, Forest Trail parent, too bad for you, Charles, and um, uh, Stephanie Callan are both those people even before when you would walk into a traditional classroom see they, they've got it they see that that color makes a difference or this thing hanging there I don't get that but I get people who know and understand that and said okay here's an opportunity you guys take a look at a few of these videos here are you interested they were pioneers in the, uh, the iPad implementation as well and off they went and said they've got this little bit of money left over from an old bond project it's called the FF and E monies I said if you had this much what could, uh, what could you do with it the paint is from their own paint brushes it's from their husband's arms and their arms and their daughter's arms as well and but the design and the setup of the classrooms is uh, all theirs and the application of it as well so I invite you to come to room 300 or 400, the top of our stairs, and pop your head in and watch how they apply the flexibility and uh, 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 the, the elements of this classroom. It's not perfect, but uh, they're learning a lot. One of the things that we're discovering is that it doesn't always, flexibility um, doesn't have to mean the walls. It means that when you want quiet and individual learning time, you need that when you need small group or larger group. And the, the actual constraints come from the kinds of furniture that we have a lot of times in the classroom. So we're, we are discovering vendors who realize that the flexibility 
being able to move and to join together, four students together, collaborate on something and then go back and be in individual uh, setting. And these pieces of furniture are a demonstration of that and, and you know, are not meaning we have to redo a whole building or a whole classroom to accomplish that desire of flexibility always. So. And it's all about managing the implementation, as we all know. You know, if we say we get you guys excited and you drop 650 nodes onto our campus, you're going to uh, not have the, the utilization implementation. So we have people on campus take an idea. And like every innovation we've done over the past 15, 20 years, uh, see people do it, and then they want it and can't wait to have it rather than having it thrust upon them. So. That's, that's an important element of this too, and what we're doing. Thank you, Mr. Wharton. We just felt that that example was such a, a testament to your vision coming to life, and really the power of taking the time to articulate that vision so that it can lend itself to these implementations. With that, Dr. Wellman, members of the board, members of the community, thank you very much. That's all we have. Uh, we're now moving on to the open forum portion of our meeting, and I've got a quick announcement to read, and then I'm going to open the floor. Uh, specific factual information and resuscitation of existing policy may be furnished in response to inquiries, but the board cannot deliberate regarding any subject that is not included on the agenda. Please be aware that the audio open form is recorded as part of the recording of the entire meeting and is published on the district's website without alteration. Persons who choose to speak in open form are consenting to the online publication of their comments. Is there anyone else that wishes to speak? Sir, please come on up to the podium and if you will identify yourself. <coughs> Thank you. I wear many hats uh, tonight. Um, father of three, Tim Coffey is my name. Uh, father of three uh, girls at Eanes Elementary, former resident of Lake Austin Estates, who had to look and consider my girls driving down BK Road 30 minutes to and from elementary school. Thankfully, I don't have that anymore. Um, a business owner here in Westlake. My wife is a business owner in Westlake and president of the Westlake Chamber of Commerce. So wear lots of hats tonight. And I tell you, I am giddy seeing these ideas out there for our kids. I, I am just stunned and delighted and so appreciative of the work that's going out by the uh, board here and by the folks. Um, I voted last time to, to spend the money to do that. It didn't work. I will do so again and, and be happy to be vocal in that effort. The, the money spends its money wisely and efficiently when compared to other districts. Somebody 40 years ago spent money and voted to spend money so my sister could graduate from Westlake High School under very difficult circumstances. Somebody spent money so uh, my girls can go through Eanes Elementary and the middle school and the high school. So I want to do that even though my girls won't benefit from the, the, the development at Eanes Elementary. They'll be gone by that time, I think. It's well worth doing. I just want to say thank you. As the chamber uh, president, uh, we support this work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cotton. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board during open forum? I'll give you one last opportunity. Our list is shorter than last time, and that's not disappointing. That's so thank you. Um, our next. Uh, before we wrap up tonight's meeting, I want to make note of upcoming meetings on Wednesday, September 25th. We have a regular board meeting here at Valley View, meeting at 6.30. October 8th, we have a study session at the Central Administration Board Room at 7.30 a.m. And then on Wednesday, October 30th, we have our regular meeting at Eanes Elementary as we continue our travel around the district. Um, there being no business, other business before the board, I'll adjourn the meeting at 9.30 p.m. on September 13th, September 10th.